Welcome to the PCR studio. My name is Simon Redwood and today we're going to be talking about the importance and the assessment of coronary physiology in patients with severe aortic stenosis. And I'm joined by my friend Flavio Ribicini. Welcome Flavio from the University of Verona. Flavio, can I start just by asking you about the prevalence of ischemic heart disease in patients with aortic stenosis? This is a very important start point because it has changed considering what we knew from the surgical era when patients were much younger, the prevalence was about 30%. Dealing with older patients undergoing TAVI, it has been shown to be over 60% in the latest uh, Sur TAVI and partner to be studied. So it comes to be a very, very common problem. So it's really very common. And that's angiographic assessment? That's angiographic assessment, what we do before implanting a valve. Sure. And I guess now that we're moving towards, gradually towards younger patients, Yes, moving the prevalence to... you think will drop? Well, it, it might be the, the prevalence will be lower, but the importance will be higher because it's not the same thing to have an important proximal LED of lesion course. when you are over 90 and the lesion has been there for 20 years when you are 55 or 70 and you are undergoing a tabic So it's an even more important subject to be talking about. I think about. so. So why is it that we're talking about this? What is it about aortic stenosis that alters physiology? Well, because we know very little about this. I mean, uh, all what we know about the prediction of inducible ischemia with invasive and non-invasive methods come from stable coronary artery disease and to a certain extent to unstable angina. But this is a totally different setting. I mean, this is aortic stenosis. So first of all, our older patients that is a trans-aortic gradient, that is lower flow into the coronary arteries, that is worse compliance with worse ventricular diastolic filling, that is higher end diastolic pressure, that is hypertrophy, there is also microcirculation dysfunction. All these put together creates a huge question mark. So it's a lot more than just left ventricular I hypertrophy. I think it's one of the most difficult and fascinating issues we are facing in research now. So, how do we assess these patients? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with invasive. Well, so if we talk about invasive assessment, doing an angiogram, doing perhaps FFR or IFR. What, what we are doing, I mean, what we started doing at the beginning of uh, TAVI was doing a coronary angiogram because you feel guilty about leaving a very tight stenosis in a proximal vessel. So we used to fix all these stenosis before. The things are changing because it has not been shown in 10 years of TAVI experience that did improve, actually improve clinical outcome. So invasive assessment based only on angiography, it's an, we, we know it's very incomplete. Apart from coronary artery disease, very likely it's even more inaccurate in aortic stenosis. So we moved in our daily practice in Verona since at least six years, we moved into intravascular physiologic assessment. But how about just stepping back a bit, if you had a patient just from a practical point of view who presents with severe aortic stenosis, they've got class 3 or 4 angina and they've got a severe proximal LED stenosis, would that be enough for you to say let's oh, just yes. treat it? In this case, but you know angina is the less frequent symptom in aortic stenosis and sometimes it uh, correlates with normal coronary arteries. It's a mystery. Angina in aortic stenosis, is, it's a mystery. Of course, if you have a tight, severe stenosis and a typical angina, we treat it. But this is not the most common, common situation. Yeah, yeah, of course. So how do we interpret FFR and IFR in these patients? Well, uh, we, we have done uh, quite a long series of cases, large series of cases. We assessed, just because of the matter of a study, we have assessed the, the FFR and the IFR before and immediately after the valve implantation, either self-expandable or balloon expandable, and we have seen that normal values remain stable. There right. is practically no change, either for FFR or IFR. Before and after TAVI. That's it. Very critical values, clearly positive IFR and FFR remain the same or even became worse, which is expected. Right. The problem is in the gray zone or the borderline values. Some uh, FFR values tend to get worse. So if you start with a 0.82, it might be 78 after you change the valve. With IFR, there is a little bit more of variability. So neither of them 
you can really rely on unless you get a value that's near one or near 0.5 or something like that. Well, this like is that. very is reliable. Right? If you measure, even if angiographically <coughs> severe, but you have an over 85 FFR, over 92 uh, uh, IFR, it's, uh, we, we have uh, done some myocardial perfusion imaging in these patients and they're all negative. So it's very reassuring having a clearly negative IFR or FFR value with the, with the follow-up that in our experience is longer than two years. You have a very, very safe deferral of these patients. That's good to know. How about non-invasive? Well, non-invasive is a very whole, old history. I mean, you know that making these old patients exercise in, in the treadmill, it's mm. uh, very difficult. You have um, echo, echo with the dobutamine, which is good for low ejection fraction, but it's very unreliable to induce ischemia. And then we have the limitations of scintigraphy, which might be difficult because of the effort, if you want to do it with effort, or with the stressor. With, uh, if you use adenosine, it might be that you don't induce a good uh, vasodilation because of sure. the problems with microcirculation. And so, everything we've talked about already. Yeah, this makes it quite a bit. And let me say this, it's a little bit out of fashion. I mean, we are going more and more on a straightforward single procedure where you put the diagnostic procedure together with the TAVI procedure and most of the time we do like this. Angio at the same time, normal arteries we go with the valve, mm -hmm. uh, borderline lesions we measure FFR, very tight clinically relevant patient complaining type typical chest pain with UPCI in the same procedure. So from a practical point of view it's FFR or IFR or both? Well, I, I cannot say if this makes really a difference. What is really important is to defer patients with a clearly normal value. Right. You can use whatever you want and if I can, if I can give an advice, I mm. would measure the physiologic parameter after you have implanted the valve. Because this is the situation in which you will send the patient home. Right. And you have removed the... So practically you put the valve in first. Yeah. You then measure and you then treat the coronary disease. Yes. If you have a clearly negative IFR or FFR value, the long-term follow-up of this patient is very good in our experience. If you have a borderline, what I would advise is to remeasure after three or four months with when all the circulation of this patient has been reassessed. And so you will, you will have a much more reliable assessment of the... And how about the clinical situation of the patient? I mean, if they didn't have any angina, would you still do that? If you found them to have a, what looks like angiographically borderline or significant stenosis? Yes, you yes would. because as we said before, we are moving to a younger population. So a young patient with a former aortic disease, because now had a good valve, yeah. still becomes a patient with coronary artery disease. So we have to take care of this. That's great. Thank you very much, Flavia. It's a pleasure. So thank you very much for watching. This is Simon Redwood, uh, who was interviewing Flavio Ribicini at the PCR studio.